I'm pleased to introduce Chen Yan Su, who will be talking to us about topological data analysis, small density vacuum, and how do you find number robustly. So, hi. Yeah, hi, I'm Chen Yan. Um, really glad to be here. Thank you very much for coming, and thanks the organizer for making this a wonderful conference. Uh, today, I'll be sharing with you my uh, current, uh, my previous work on topological data analysis, and specifically um, my work on finding a small density vacuum in a robust manner. Now, there are many fancy words on the screen, but um, for a very concrete, simple example, uh, here we have a map of the US. Uh, each point is actually a cell tower that receives phone signals. And uh, there are some sparse regions. For example, this is the Oregon Desert. And this is Lake Michigan. And obviously, there's no cell towers on the lake. The traditional method is very effective at picking up uh, the, last, the large sparse region here because it's big. But uh, even for something uh, of the size of Lake Michigan, uh, the traditional method tends to struggle because it's relatively small. So uh, my work will be trying to find these relatively smaller holes um, that complements the traditional method. And I'll assume that uh, people here do not know a lot about topological data analysis, and I'll walk you through the basic concepts and the basic tools. Um, so topology is about roughly about simplifying geometry. Um, so you say that the coffee mug and the donut are essentially the same because they're the same in the holes. And um, topological data analysis is about finding a way to use such topological insights to understand data. So on the right, we have a picture of the internet back in 2001. Uh, you can see there's a dense core of points, and there are these flares of edges that fly around it. And it would be appealing to have a more succinct way to describe the data set rather than, other than by uh, enumerating all the vertices at the edges. And as topologists, it would be very tempting to say there's some sort of big vertex, and there are some like uh, circles uh, around it. Uh, since I do not work intimately with the uh, internet data set, I will not say too much about uh, the data set. But the idea remains the same. How can we apply topological insights to understand data? And in order to walk through the basic concept, of our work with a much simpler data set than uh, the internet, namely some point sample near a circle. Now, the first obstacle to use topology is that if you just have a bunch of points, uh, the homology is trivial. They're just points. What we to fix that is to uh, thicken each point with the disk. Now you have the gray thing, and the gray thing is a homotopy circle. And that's nice. However, your computer doesn't really like um, union of circles, and it doesn't really like homotopy theory. So you have to turn this gray thing into something the computer can manage. Um, and computers like simple show complexes, because you can enumerate vertices, edges, and uh, faces. So you can construct different simplicial complexes. For example, here we have the nerve complex. The nerve complex is homotopy equivalent to the unit of disks, and is, it can be stored in a computer. And then you can do homological computation on the computer, and the computer will agree with you that this is at least a homological circle. But this uh, approach comes with the caveat. Uh, you have to choose your radius very carefully. If the radius is too small, it doesn't form a circle, a homotopy circle. And if, even if it's slightly larger, you have this artificial hole. And as, if you're a homotopy theory, theorist, uh, this should be an alarm bell, because um, you usually do not choose your parameter. Instead, you choose all of them. And this is what people do. So instead of looking at one single radius, you vary your radius and keep growing your balls. Okay, so you have some small balls, growing bigger becomes this, grows bigger becomes this, and eventually you have one giant gray blob. And as you grow the balls, the homology uh, groups change along the way. And the change in homology groups can be succinctly summarized by this persistence diagram, where the x-axis is the first time of this uh, homology class, and the y-axis is the death time of homology class. So for this point here, uh, its birth time is 0 0.5 something, death time 0 0.8 something. It corresponds to this polygon we have here. It's born at around 0 0.5 something. You have this cycle. And by 0 0.8 something, it becomes a boundary. So the homology class uh, vanishes. The traditional wisdom is that uh, 
points that are far away from the diagonal are more important because this point, I mean, the cycle doesn't look very important. Um, and it's very near the diagonal because it dies shortly after it's born. And the point up there corresponds to the big loop that we intended to find in the first place. So that's the traditional wisdom. So if you're interested in finding large holes, uh, the traditional method works pretty well. But if you're interested in finding small holes, um, then you have to be um, more careful. So up to this point, are there any questions? So we'll be looking at these persistence diagrams quite a lot. So if you have questions, please don't, uh, don't hesitate to ask. If no, that will bring me to uh, my project of finding small density vacuum in a robust manner. This is joint work with my supervisor, Professor Semoviski, and Professor Yu. Uh, they're statisticians, so this talk will be slightly statistical in flavor. And it's also joint work with Andre Yao, who is my undergraduate uh, mentee. And uh, many of the fancy pictures uh, we, we've just seen uh, are product of uh, Andre. And he's also very helpful with uh, uh, running simulations. So before I tell you what I uh, what, um, what I proposed, uh, let's once again start with a simple data set. This is a cosmologically motivated data set. Cosmologists believe that uh, most galactic mass is concentrated near vertices, edges, and uh, walls in the universe. And um, they're interested in how to, how to understand the void uh, in the universe. Now, three-dimensional actual cosmological data sets are difficult to work with, and they're definitely difficult to visualize. So we will we'll work instead with two-dimensional data sets. Um, these are artificial data points that are generated. Uh, it captures the essential uh, property of the model. Uh, you still have points that are near some vertices and edges. And not all of the vertices, I'm uh, sorry, not all of the points are on the edges. They can be like slightly far away from the edges. And the void in the form also may not be uniform. Like these uh, voids in the middle, they are smaller. These voids on the side, they're bigger. So uh, the idea is that uh, in reality, we believe that these are, there are voids of different sizes, and they also have noise. And we want to find a way to uh, find the smaller voids uh, in a robust manner. So these two problems are well-known problems. I mean, people have tried to solve them in different ways. It goes all the way back to Carlson and Zimmerman uh, back in 2009. And the latest work besides mine is uh, Hickok from UCLA. Um, I will not go into details so of uh, what people did individually. But the idea is that different people have different trade-offs between uh, the smallest hole the algorithm can see, uh, how, much ro how much noise your algorithm can tolerate, and also how much computational power you have. And I will show you my own trade-off uh, of the problem, and I'll give you a statistical model that highlights small features uh, and, how to, and a way to estimate uh, these features in a robust manner. So first problem, size. Now, uh, there are two squares on the slide, uh, and then you do a PhD, you learn topological data analysis, and you plug into topological data analysis machinery, and then you only see one square. So what's the problem? That's because uh, when you grow balls, uh, this square is quickly filled, and so uh, you cannot easily see that in the traditional setup. Now since the problem is that uh, when the ball grows just slightly, the, ball, uh, the hole is filled, what you could do is that you grow your balls very slowly on the small square. That will compensate for the uh, smallness of the hole. And the theory of growing balls at a customized rate was proposed by Bellatel in 2019. And we used the setup and plug in the rate being one of the density rates to of D. The idea is that if you're small, but if you have many points, your density will be high. And if you want to grow your ball slowly, then you want this rate. And so once you do that, um, you will now have two points that are far away from the diagonal, and you're happy. Now you can see there are two squares. Why do we use this uh, rate density rate one over d? In particular, why this exponent? Uh, that will give you what I call the Ant-Man property. Namely, if you scale your data set in a uniform manner, you recover exactly the same 
persistence diagram because um, your density will scale in some way, and then your distance will also scale in some way, and they'll cancel. And that will give you exactly the same distance diagram. So here there are two squares um, which are scaled versions of each other. You see two overlapping points, so they have roughly the same first and best time. So here comes the first VIP at the top, very important proposition, also known as theorem. Uh, if you have a small hole surrounded by a dense region, the persistence, that is the depth minus birth of the cycle, uh, scales roughly at, uh, at the rate of the density raised to some power and the size um, of the hole. So the idea is that even if your size is small, if the surrounding density is high enough, uh, the persistence will not be too small. So that settles the first problem. Second problem, noise. So that was the clean data set. If we con contaminate it with a few outliers here, you will immediately have four more connected components, and that's bad because you start with two, now you say there are six, and you make such a big error just because there are four extra data points. So this is bad, and this is also, uh, this also actually a well-known problem. And uh, there is a solution proposed by Chazel in around uh, 2011. And the idea is that you don't just uh, take the first data point that uh, uh, give you the uh, ball. You wait for several more points, uh, several more balls to hit you uh, in order to decide uh, when you should be counted to be inside the space. And if you combine um, the distance to measure idea with the growing ball at different rate idea uh, previously, you get the proposed uh, robust density aware distance of that uh, filtration that I proposed. And uh, if you plug in the previous outlier contaminated data set into the proposed algorithm, you get roughly a similar persistence diagram with two points still far away from the diagonal with roughly similar uh, birth and death time as before despite the outliers. So here comes the second VIP. Uh, if you start with some density f, and then you perturb it by, uh, to be some f tilde, possibly by outliers, or possibly by um, added noise, then under the condition, your persistence diagram will only be put up, uh, up to some uh, error, error measure between f and f tilde. So the idea is that if f tilde is not too far away from f, then you're good. So I promised you two data sets. One of, the, one of them is the cosmologically motivated data set. The other is the map US. Let's see how the proposed method performs. OK. So uh, recall we have these points sampled uh, near edges from this graph. And if you use uh, the traditional method, you'll pick up the gray and the red points. So and if you use our method, you pick up the gray and the uh, blue points. So you can see that our method can pick up much more points in the middle uh, that the traditional method cannot pick up. Uh, we do miss a few of them, the four red dots on the side, but there are not too many of them. So this is nice. And the cellular tile data set. Okay. So here I've mentioned that uh, this is the Oregon Desert, and this is Lake Michigan. Um, I think it's also conspicuous that there's this hole, this hole, this hole here. So I've looked up the map. These are actually Texas towns. Uh, I do not think they, there should be a pocket of emptiness. Uh, uh, probably those towns refused or neglected or did not uh, submit their data set to the federal government. And that's why we have these pockets. Um, but for all intents and purposes, if we want to find holes, they are holes. Uh, it's just that they are holes from of different natures. And if you uh, use the traditional method, you will see that one of the points is uh, far away from the diagonal. And if you use a proposed method, you see that three points are far away from the diagonal. What are they? They are precisely um, the Oregon Desert, which the traditional method picks up, and uh, Lake Michigan, which our method picks up, and also two of these pockets. Uh, we cannot pick up the third one because there's this like there are too few data points like closing up the uh, the bay-ish area, so the algorithm cannot tell whether it's a bay or like it's a lake or lake-ish things. Okay, so um, 
So I hope I've convinced you that the pro proposed method is uh, uh, good for detecting small holes in a robust manner, at least in a simple setup. If you have a complicated setup, then you may have to do something more fancy. Um, so that was the, our previous work we've submitted in our paper. Uh, but there's a lot that we could do uh, starting from here. Uh, first of all, this is a numerical algorithm and it would be nice to have efficient approximation. Uh, here we are working with 2D data sets. If you work at higher dimensions, you do need uh, the competition to be scalable and for that we need uh, to approximate our, uh, our function in a more efficient way. Our second uh, question uh, would be more uh, mathematical or theoretical in nature. That would be how do you uh, decide uh, which points are far into the angle. So there is a way uh, I drew those lines. I didn't just like throw dots on the board and decide where they should go. Uh, but the method is more empirical, uh, and we do not have a like um, encompassing theory to explain like how good these um, uh, these green lines should perform. Uh, it does work pretty well on empirical data sets, um, but it would be nice to have theories too. Uh, explain why they work well or when they work well. So this is about uh, extension of the current project. Uh, currently I'm working on studying the homology of preferential attachment complexes. The idea is that um, if you look at real data, they do not conform to any particular model, and sometimes you may not be able to say as much about these because they are what they are. Now, uh, with the preferential attachment model, you have an analytical formula that you can do explicit computation, and then you can prove more definitive theorems about how these complexes perform. So this is what I'm currently working on. In the long run, I think um, it's a big question how we can marry topology and statistics together, um, and this is really difficult on many levels. First of all, traditionally, topologists don't speak a lot with statisticians. That's one obstacle. The other obstacle is that the field themselves have very different flavor. So topology is not very fluffy things. So you can homotopy your way through and everything are the same. But in statistics, you have very rigid model like normal and cushy distribution are very different. But if you draw the graph, they look roughly the same. Um, so it would be nice to uh, have an organic combination of logical and statistical theory. And um, I hope, so this is uh, what Bobcat, uh, 18 something or 20 something? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so I hope that at Buckhead, uh, maybe 60, I can answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming to my talk. And uh, uh, that's the end of the talk. All right, <laughs> All right questions? Um, well, I had a question. Yes. Um, so, like, how do we like choose the scaling rate? Like, how do we choose how much that we can like zoom in, especially if we say don't have a picture? Um, so you mean? Um, um, it's like in, when you look at like those persistence diagrams. It's like in the second picture, like the the scales are a lot smaller mm -hmm. than the first one. Mm -hmm. How do you choose like how small you want the scales to be? So you're essentially saying how I draw the green line. Maybe yeah. this is actually still very close to the data, yeah. right? Uh, that's a very good question. So what we did is that we resampled from the data set, mm -hmm. and that will give us a way to gauge how random the persistence diagram is going to be. Mm -hmm. So if you do a lot of these such resampling, and the, and this point comes to here or here or here, but it never hits the gray region, then mm -hmm. you have like this. That gives you some confidence that, well, probably this thing will, uh, is actually there. Uh, but if you do a lot of resampling, and sometimes this point is here, sometimes this point is here, sometimes this point is here, sometimes here, then if it very often hits this gray region, then uh, we say it's close enough to that. Okay, and that's what we currently do. Um, we do not have a theorem that says this will guarantee you will get some provably uh, nice points. But uh, in practice, it, uh, it works uh, at least in the simple data sets. Thank you. Yes? Uh, so, supposing your holes have like a dense boundary, how small of a hole can you detect? Like, can you quantify? So, uh, if you look at our first theorem, yeah. uh, the persistence, the persistence 
is at least this thing, and this thing scales with uh, your size and your uh, density threshold. So um, this house, the size will depend on like how uh, different the density looks. So here your density jumps from zero to this very high value. So uh, uh, even if this hole is small, then you have a high, not long persistence. So the size of the hole will determine how long it stays on. Uh, the size of the hole will affect how long it stays. Um, okay, then you, yes. So you're using first. Okay. Oh. But then, if you have a very small hole, okay, if you have many points around a region, but you never fill it, then um, you, there's reason to believe that it's actually there. Okay. Um, this does matter when you try to find small things because if you have, uh, if you have four points. Is it a square? Like, <laughs> if your density is low, then you can't really say much about it. Or like you need like other priors to help you decide whether it's actually a hole. Also, the other thing, like so for the green line thing, could you have like a simulation where you can shift the green line and see which holes it's corresponding to? Like these points are corresponding to some holes somewhere, right? Yes. So uh, I, so. In this implementation, you can find out the um, the pixel that is the yeah. last thing that fill the hole, yeah. and that will usually be in the center of the hole. So that's how I plot these things, um, and uh, it works because I'm using a cubical complex. Uh, if you use some other ways to compute these things, uh, you may have to uh, be careful of finding out which cycle it corresponds to. You also, this method also works uh, only for co-dimensional one holes. If you have a co-dimensional two holes, then uh, you, the relationship between the pixel, the last pixel and the position is more ambiguous. Or like, what do you mean by the position of like a co-dimensional two thing? Yeah, uh, if you have something that's like super curved, but it's still like a single hole. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have a knot in R3, then uh, What's the position of the knot? That that's kind of like difficult to say. But if you're co-dimension one, you could. Yes. Um, so like these examples is like we see that there's holes. Like we can like visually see that there's like these tiny holes, and then we did this algorithm, and then we like confirm like that this algorithm can find these small holes. Mm -hmm. Has this algorithm ever been used on a data set where like we didn't know that there was holes in the data set, but then using this algorithm we actually found them? I have not tried that, mm -hmm. and the reason of like the major reason is that if I show people that I find these holes, mm -hmm. it is really difficult to interpret what those holes are, mm -hmm. and people will look at me and think I'm nuts. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is not really what I can find, but what I can interpret and what I can convince other people that this is actually something there rather than like my figment of imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one difficulty of uh, working with real data sets because you, in that case you do want to work with like domain experts so that when you see something they can tell you whether it makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. um, um, since I do not, I'm currently not collaborating with the cosmologists, mm -hmm. it is very difficult for me to like go to work with a real cosmological data set, find something and like say something definitive, definitive about it. Mm -hmm. But in the long run I hope I can do something like that. Yeah, that would be cool. Okay, so you also said that like for the cosmological data that you missed some of the points based mm -hmm. like there is no method we are able to detect. Like is there some understanding that why did that happen? Or like does it happen often like for different data set or was it like something specific to this case? Um I think okay, the, there are multiple possible reasons. First of all, you do see that um, Any cool these things. things. Next slide, I think. Like you have. Well, I actually found everything, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, this one. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, first of all, the traditional method does not pick up all the holes. So, okay. this yeah. not picked up, this not picked up, this not picked up, and there's a good reason for that because, uh, like, is this really a hole? Mm -hmm. uh, so I generated the set from the lines are true, but then. Uh, the noise can be pretty severe here. 
So is this really a hole? Like, maybe not. So there's a reason why even the traditional method does not pick up the big holes. Uh, our method of miss some of some of the bigger holes, partly because there's more variability, partly because the density is lower, so balls do grow quicker in those regions, and also partly because things are random, so sometimes you just randomly miss things. So it doesn't happen often like for different data like it I mean it does happen, for example in the Oregon Desert, uh, we miss the Oregon Desert. Uh, because the again balls grow too quickly. Okay, so if in, in, in like practical application, I should like focus on like doing both like the traditional and the RDA and the like. So the yeah, I, it would be recommendable to run both. Uh, I don't think the computational capacity is too different. Um, so if you do want to find holes of like many different scales, then you want to see both things. If you only care about small holes, you can use our method. If you only care about big holes, you can just stick to the traditional method. Yes. So a good explanation was that like it was not able to like get that hole because the density around that was not, like yes. the density was low. The density is too low, balls grow too quickly, yeah. and our method is designed to focus on high density region more. Yeah. So is it also supposed to be like a noise because the density is low and there are like not a lot of data? In so in general, you should be very careful when you try to, un uh, to understand low density regions because yeah. low density means you know very little about those regions, yeah. and if you want to say anything about them, you have to be careful. So, uh, have you also done like the average thing, like the average persistence diagram on it? On, on it, like you have like good theory, like good statistical theory on persistence landscape thing, um, like where you do average in like la random generated so, data. And, so if you have so. Uh, we stop at persistence diagram because uh, the paper is complicated enough. Uh, you could run the same persistence landscape thing. I, so uh, my understanding is that uh, persistence landscape gives you mean variance and like you have good like uh, uh, functional statistical tools. Uh, I believe the same tools will work just because we're essentially just looking at a different regression. Uh, persistence landscape works for different regressions. I think there's a question. Uh, so another question on the comment part. Uh, this reminds me of the one time after I was looking for vacuoles in uh, plant cells, mm -hmm. which I feel like a fun data set to study. Uh, so, so because they're all like holes in. So, so plant so. cells. Uh, you mean so plant cells roughly look like these, right? Yeah. So when you look at plant cells. Uh, then there are these big holes which are like vacuoles. Mm -hmm. And so for images, he was trying to find the vacuum. Mm -hmm. So which might be something that this method can actually help Um I hope there will be. Uh, but then this method uh, does care a lot about density. Yes. And here, uh, density, what density means is not as clear. Yes, yeah, so like pixels but, just. Yes, yeah, but then maybe pixel intensity will give you some way to like help um, to change your rate of uh, bulk growth, so that you can have, you can see the uh, smaller things more clearly. Um, but I think that's definitely a very interesting direction. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the comment. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.